Hello and welcome to In the Making, a series of virtual conversations from North Bennett Street School where we connect with a range of new voices, fields, and perspectives. My name is Kristen Odell. I'm a staff member and host of In the Making here at NBSS. America's first trade school, North Bennett, was found in 1881 by visionary educator, philanthropist, and suffragette Pauline Agassiz Shaw. Today, we're known globally for our range of programs and courses in hand-based craft and trades, which help folks achieve meaningful careers or even just learn some new skills. We also partner with like-minded organizations from schools and museums to nonprofits and community service orgs. And we couldn't do that without the great facility that we have, which brings us to today's program, The Face of the Neighborhood, a virtual tour of America's first trade school, part of Boston Design Week 2020. Thank you all for being here. We're joined by Frano Violich, award-winning architect and the founding principal of Kennedy and Violich Architects, and Nathan Abbey, award-winning violin making and repair student here at North Bennett Street School. It's also worth noting that Nathan had studied architecture before, prior to becoming a violin maker. And he's also in his third year here, and he has been a student worker all of this time. So he is very familiar with the building. So he has a, a big seat at this table. Through the following images and conversation, we'll see and hear two vantage points. One from the perspective of a trade school and its student, the other from the architect who helped to create our current home. Since its founding in 1881, NBSS has been a fixture of its North End neighborhood. Originally nestled in several small buildings within the interior of the community, the school moved to its expansive new home, the most prominent surviving example of Georgian revival civic architecture in Boston near the Rose Kennedy Greenway in 2013. Designed by John M. Gray, the Depression era masonry structures were envisioned as a single civic complex with three distinct facades as part of the East Boston Tunnel Project in 1934. These buildings were listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2015. Where we were, Housed for 130 years at 39 North Bennett Street, the original building was never intended as a school. Originally built as a church with a smaller footprint, it was converted into a home for visiting mariners in the early 1800s. With added dormitories and exterior walls built to the curb, 39 North Bennett Street was more suited to our original mission as a settlement house than to what we ultimately became America's oldest trade school. I have this slide here just showing, um, you can see the yellow is the original footprint of what was a church and this is Salem Street and this is North Bennett Street here. Um, so these were dormitories and rooms built onto the exterior structure of a church, which then became classrooms at, when we became a trade school. Founded in 1881 as the North End Industrial Home by Polly Nagazi Shaw, NBSS was one of Boston's pioneering social service agencies, providing immigrants a path to self-sufficiency by learning manual skills for gainful employment. NBSS taught vocational and life skills and provided a variety of social services to the North End community, including libraries, reading rooms, day nurseries, and a gymnasium. In 1885, Shaw worked with the Boston Public Schools to provide manual training classes, and the settlement home became known as the North Bennett Street Industrial School. About a century later, the school shifted its focus to education in craftsmanship and traditional trades and today has nine distinct full-time professional craft training programs, bookbinding, cabinet furniture making, carpentry, jewelry making and repair, locksmithing and security technology, piano technology, preservation carpentry, and violin making and repair. 
And I'm just guiding you through these stunning images of the original building as it once was. And if I'm going too fast, um, not to worry, you'll, you'll have a recording of this afterwards so you can sort of take your time and parse through them. This picture is just amazing. This is an old rooftop of 39 North Bennett Street School and kids turning on lathes. And um, I will note that these the lantern making was once a craft taught at North Bennett Street School, and I have one behind me on this piano that at some point I'll bring up closer so you can see it. Where we are now, relocated in 2013 to 150 North Street, a former police station and Boston City printing house combined into one 65,000 square foot complex. How is this possible? In concert with the city of Boston and Mayor Menino, our president at that time, Miguel Gomez Ibanez, a former architect and graduate of the school, helped secure our current home where I sit now at 150 North Street. We were fortunate to stay in the neighborhood in which we were founded and also to provide a new home for the city's K through eight Elliott School, which took over our former space here at 39 North Bennett Street. Two of our programs, locksmithing and carpentry, were off-site at that time. Our Under One Roof campaign sought to bring all of our trades back into one facility here at 150 North Street. We are grateful for the generosity of many individuals and institutions, some of whom are with us today, who helped make the campaign a success. I threw this image in to share. Um, I wanted to take a moment to sort of just feel the weight on, of, of what faculty experienced as they came from this cobbled together deep in the North End building that was never meant to be a trade school into 150 North where they could see this expanse and sort of watch it being molded to what they needed it to be in order to function well as a trade school. So here you see um, Martha Kearsley, a bookbinding instructor, and Jack Stebbins, a former piano technology instructor. And I just love it. They don't look really excited or anything, but it's just, a, it's, I just feel like we wanna capture, you know, just that moment that how much joy this was for them as faculty. So to best explain our need for space and what is required of space to function best as a trade school, I'll show you bench room comparisons by program between where we were and where we are now. So you'll see on the left is our former lathe room at 39 North Bennett. It's cramped, low ceilings. Everything is sort of, you know, wherever it will fit. Um, no natural light compared to our lathe room where we are now, which is on the corner of North Street and our Wingate Gallery. And just the orientation of the lathes, the instructor can be at the front of the room. Um, there's just so much more light and flexibility there. Here we have preservation carpentry bench room on the left, on at 39 North Bennett, the benches are small. They're probably 24 inches by 48 inches. Um, every bench has about 30 inches of space in between one another, kind of difficult to function. Compared to the space on the right where we are now, um, something to consider preservation carpentry is they handle a lot of heavy timbers to further timber framing, a lot of heavy wood using big machinery they needed this kind of space. And you could see the benches are twice the size and all of the windows, and it's just quite the difference. Um, this is probably one of my favorite images, the machine room on the left, the original machine room from 39 North Bennett. Um, I just am laughing, thinking of woodworkers struggling to get <laughs> large planks of wood in there into these planers and how many times people bumped into that pole that's unfortunately located right in the middle of the machine room. Um, but somehow they managed to do it for so many years <laughs> compared to where we are now, which is this bright light um, 
well laid out, large room. Frano can probably speak to how it was, the, the machine rooms were built in the center of the program so that we could, so that we wouldn't have to sacrifice any windows which are clutch to being in this space. And violin bedroom from 39 North Bennett, you can see is tiny cramped. Um, Nathan mentioned once that I think you heard a rumor that people taped their bench spaces off to, de to demarcate their area. Compared to where we are now, which is the whole lined with windows on one side. Um, each student has their own space. It's just a beautiful, vibrant space. And we'll get to talking about that in a little bit. Picture of a violin bench space and a student at the old building. And here's, here's Nathan at his bench with that natural light. And here's the former bindery at 39 North Bennett, very tight, um, low ceilings, minimal window, little hard to navigate compared to where we are now, which is this broad, light, expansive space. Um, and this is only one of three rooms in the bindery. Off to the right, there are two other rooms that house bigger equipment, like large board shears and large presses. And a fun fact that I think we'll get to this um, later as well is this, the strategic placement of the bindery was on the opposite side of the programs that used, made a lot of noise, machinery noise. And Frano mentioned that it was placed next to the Wingate Gallery because some of the equipment used in bookbinding is so stunning to look at these large presses and the metal and the material. And so someone had the brilliant idea of making those visible through the middle gallery of the school, which I'm grateful for. Here's um, cabinet and furniture bench room from where we were. You can see it's tiny and tight and they're bursting at the seams. And if you look closely, you see that there's just things tucked wherever they can find space. Compared to where we are now in this magnificent cabinet and furniture department, which goes around a U shape um, along this right wall, which is the machine room, it goes all the way around and mirrors itself on the other side. So it's vast. And they just have three times the amount of workspace per person, it feels like. And I'm gonna turn it over to Frano at this point. And Thank you just tell me, tell me which pace you want me to go. I will, I will. Thanks, Kristen. Um, gosh, I love talking uh, about the North Bennett Street School. It is such a magical place. I wish we could all be there because there's something that you get from the place viscerally um, when you're walking through it. You're 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 hearing the sounds of the the machinery. Sometimes you hear the sounds of violins being tested, pianos being tuned. Uh, you smell the materials, um, the wood. Uh, it is it is really something else. Um, it's almost like, I describe it sometimes like time travel. It, mm -hmm. You're both going back in time, right? Because this is like this image here. Um, these are all trades and crafts that have existed for many, many years. Uh, but you're also maybe going into the future, which I like that kind of ambiguity about uh, the, the program, because there are many questions about uh, how to teach design and how to teach and the, the importance of making in design. So uh, I want to take a, a, a step back like 10,000 feet up and, and, and a few hundred years back and just look at the immense change that has happened uh, since the 17th century and today uh, in terms of the use of materials making and design and technology as well. So here you see this image um, and look at the scale of everything. The houses are so small, their footprints are so light, the touch 
on the land is so um, delicate that you really start to think about, wow, um, what kind of footprint has been left at this time? And I think that these are really important things when, for example, you go to the next slide, and this is 1995, uh, this is the central artery when it was still there. And the, ch the, the change, there's no more water there. The footprints of, of, of buildings and urban infrastructure highways uh, and tunnels have this enormous impact. And I think it's something to really think about um, overall in terms of the impact that design has on the environment. So when you think about the kind of considerations that, go, that went into um, Pauline Agassiz and Shaw's intentions to bring this kind of craft, this handcraft, this understanding of technology to the making, yes, of small things, but it does have an influence on how we make even big things. It's a sensibility. It's a sensibility about care, about commitment, also a, a sensibility about mindfulness. Uh, these are all things that are integral to the program of North Bennett Street. And it's, uh, if you can go to the next, mm -hmm. you can see that, 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 you know, the kind of impact that, that, uh, that it has uh, on, on the program, as you'll see in a minute. So this is 1931, 32. Uh, this is the uh, Tunnel Administration Building under construction. So this is when they built the Sumner Tunnel, which is a mile-long tunnel under the harbor. And you can see here this kind of shift, the scalar shift uh, between what was the North End, these kind of uh, brick and uh, uh, buildings, wood structure, and the kind of use of steel now, because steel at this point is really going full force, and concrete is being used. And you have this juxtaposition. And by the way, this is exactly where uh, the central space, as you'll see, uh, for the North Bennett Street is built within this structure. Next. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about the urban uh, kind of approach that we took. Okay, so the biggest challenge to this project, in my view, was programming it. Uh, there were eight or nine, I can't remember exactly at the time, but um, nine programs, and they were scattered all over, Arlington, South Boston, uh, and then, of course, on North Bennett Street, where they were all kind of crammed in and closeted and hidden from view. Um, around this kind of old church that had houses being built around it, the Christian church. So how do you bring all of these programs that are so vast in scale? I mean, jewelry really takes this much space to make something, and carpentry takes thousands of square feet. I mean, they had a butler building in Arlington, and how do you bring them into a city? And fortunately, uh, through the creativity and passion of Miguel, uh, Gomez Ibanez and a lot of other people, um, the city, I would say the mayor as well, everybody wanted to make this work. So, but it was kind of insane because who in their right mind would bring a factory with material handling, loading docks, uh, uh, all the uh, kind of circulation that you, you need, uh, the trucks, who would bring that right into the center of the city? It was an insane idea. Mm -hmm. But it was beautifully insane. <laughs> and uh, it created quite a lot of passion and it gave everybody kind of a goal to, to like, we've got to get this done. So essentially it was inserting this little piece, this central piece, if you want to go to the next mm -hmm. slide, Kristen, in between what was the police station on the left and the printing plant on the right. Now, of course, cloaked in this kind of call it modern materials that were being used in the 1930s of concrete and steel. This is cloaked in a kind of neo-Georgian architecture, which one we accepted um, uh, and actually required historical review. So this went through the National Park Service's tech tax credit program in order to make this building affordable. And the afforded, making this building affordable was a real hurdle. Uh, and but it, it was done. The next slide. Mm -hmm. So this insertion then uh, becomes the key, really the the, the kind of uh, linchpin between this these two disparate buildings. There, these two disparate buildings are on different floors. They, uh, so they don't they never connected. 
um, the, the 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 disparate programs who were that were scattered all over the the, cit the city didn't have a common space to meet. So there was no sort of sense of social connection between the programs. So jewelry couldn't talk to preservation carpentry, cabinetry couldn't talk to bookbinding, and they, they didn't have those differences that sometimes can create sparks and energy to any kind of creative uh, making act. Next. Uh, this is the administration building, um, now complete in 1932. And then if you go to the next, you can see the tunnel um, coming through. Now, what was interesting uh, in this project was that there was no back. There is no back to, the, to, to this kind of industrial um, activity that goes on. So there's no loading dock where you can kind of hide stuff. Uh, if you go to the back of the building, you drop into a tunnel um, that is highly used, heavily used. So that caused problems, uh, challenges in terms of how do you change windows? So we had to actually shut down the a federal highway for several hours twice to put up the scaffolding and take it down. So bond construction was did an incredible job here. If you can go to the next. Uh, this is a absolutely key image of uh, that really shows how these three major uh, uh, sources of natural light began to allow for uh, the collection of programs around them. So the NDSS that you see to the right, that's an outdoor courtyard uh, that the larger programs like carpentry, uh, cabinet making, that, that, that they, they were able to benefit from the large floor plates. Uh, whereas on the left, where you have the small skylight, you have then book binding and you have piano, is it piano tuning? Piano technology. Mm -hmm. Piano technology, and you have the administration. Then in the central space, you have the uh, social space. What's key though to that central space is that we were able to insert a central stair, because there was no stair at the center, and then one could begin to move out from there to these wings, which were quite far away from the center, as well as putting an elevator that skewered through that had door a door on both sides, a two-sided elevator that could allow for access to floors that did not align up. So you'd go up half a floor, get off, and then you go up another half a floor and get off, mm -hmm. if you can go to the next. Mm -hmm. I like those kinds of moves. I think they're kind of uh, sort of sleight of hands um, uh, magic that, that uh, people don't necessarily really notice, but makes, mm -hmm. makes things work. This is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, garage. This is where, um, you know, People would be brought in and taken to holding cells, um, and this was transformed into the uh, uh, entry. Uh, this made this, this the space accessible from the uh, uh, from the sidewalk. If you could go to the next, and then this is the bookstore um, that had some challenges in terms of you know securing it at night with the stair beginning to take its kind of vertical promenade as it spirals up to the top. Kristen, do you want to just say something uh, briefly about how this works for you? Sure. Um, so I run the store, the, the school store in the gallery space, and, um, and I, I love it. I mean, I don't know what more to say. It's, um, it's what you see when you first come in. And this, this shot was taken at a time where we had a bookbinding exhibit up, and they, we actually used the entire downstairs for the show. And so I hung all of, you know, pieces of it down in here. Typically the shows are held upstairs in Wingate, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but most, what I'm mostly struck by in this picture is that staircase. You know, we, we sort of, I think all of us here might take it for granted because we just come in every day and you see it. But it's, it's so welcoming to see in, an, in a photograph like this, it, it reminds me of, um, it's welcoming to people who walk into school here and it is like a warm, you know, there's something just warm and receiving about the stairs that sort of guides you up to where you're supposed to be. I love that. <laughs> Think about your garage next time. <laughs> yeah, what it be. yeah uh, right? Uh, so if you go to the next one, mm -hmm. uh, then as you move up to the second floor, uh, you're in this kind of giant 28-foot uh, high ceiling space uh, with both the plant printing plant and the police station facade. So you're sort of inside, outside simultaneously. And I, 
I, we really enjoyed that kind of ambiguity, um, the kind of light that, that the space uh, gets in there, but especially the ability to exhibit large scale um, elements uh, that are produced at the school. In this case, this would be historic this, preservation. Is that right? right, such as this piece. This is a, a, a recreation of the door on the John Hancock house that Preservation Carpentry has been working on for a couple of years, doing different stages of it. And um, this is a year and a half ago or so, our, our annual celebration of craft in 2019. And at this stage, at this moment, down the hall from me here, um, they, they actually have the um, this sort of sandstone, brownstone paint finish on this facade at this point. So it's constantly changing, which is another awesome use of this space that there's, whether it's PC that's using it, they're, if they're working on something large scale, it takes a lot of time. And so every time you walk by, there's something new to it and it's just constantly mm -hmm. changing and evolving. And in the next image, Kristen, you, you, you can see there's two, there are two levels of gallery. Uh, one uh, at, the, at the mezzanine level, which is um, actually the third floor. And um, I, I'm, I'm uh, so impressed really by what you guys put together in terms of the furniture design exhibits, the jewelry design, and the book binding. So you get these, when you, when you guys put your, your exhibits, especially the end of year student shows, you see the massive scale and range of scales that everyone's doing from this kind of house construction to something as itty bitty as a book that's two by three inches. Um, these kind of little notebooks. Anyway, mm -hmm. it's, uh, this is a very powerful uh, space. That's- It is. And, and it is a space that, and I don't know if you still use this in that way, but it was intended to have all departmental meetings and public lectures and conferences. And I've had dinner uh, in this space. So it's used for many, many different. Right. I mean, due to current situations, it's not used that way, um, just like any public, you know, any of our public spaces. But um, it is a communal place. I mean, I don't, you know, Nathan can probably attest to that. It's kind of you know when you're when you're in your department it's one of the spaces where you're going to cross pollinate with your your neighboring craft person great okay yeah. so do you want to go to the next sure yeah so now we're um on that same second floor and i'm just going to take everybody through just a, a two or three different programs so that you can get a kind of a sense and i'll, I'll wrap this up brief uh, quickly so this is book binding which you saw uh, before um, and if you can go to the next slide, uh, this was a before <laughs> of book binding, and then uh, that was this space was turned into. If you could show the next slide. And so let me just preface this, um, Frano. This is the this is a, a portion of the former police station. Correct. Right. right. It would be overlooking the sent the uh, the tunnel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it is now. So, so really, from a from a design standpoint, th this is really a transformation project. For, uh, I mean, there was so much there to to work with. So it was it was strategic moves of um, insertions, removing, replacing. So in this case, we replaced the windows, took the glass block out, we re removed the ceiling to get the height, and this is where storage uh, materials are left which can be seen from the gallery space of where the book covers are and papers and binding areas. So it becomes a kind of back uh, behind, you know, backstage kind of view uh, for people to see. Mm -hmm. Want to go to the next? Mm -hmm. And then this is uh, jewelry, which is on the same floor. This is one of my favorite spaces. Um, it we place this in one of the narrowest wings or arms of the printing plant so that it would get light from both sides. And unlike many other layouts, uh, the layout for this space kept the benches pretty much in, inside, the uh, not up against the windows, but as islands. But if you go to the next slide, you can see in violin making, the, the benches are placed against the windows because there you need, you can take much more advantage of these enormous windows. There were 170 windows total. Everyone was replaced. 
Um, and they are large windows. They're, I think they're like seven feet by four feet and they're mm -hmm. all operable. So ventilation would be just really key. We can get into the mechanics of this building uh, later if you wanna to go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this is uh, cabinetry. Uh, this is going- yeah, Cabinet and furniture, yeah. Uh, cabinet and furniture. And this is uh, going up one floor if you wanna to go to the next. And so this was sort of what we were given once the, uh, all of the printing presses were removed, all the files that were removed, we found such incredible stuff in there, old newspapers and uh, parking ticket printing. They did every, this is where they printed everything. So we were just sort of given this vast space. And I think what's key here is the, the, uh, the, the coffered ceiling you see here is a two-way concrete system, which uh, is done, uh, you can't afford it today, but it's done to provide large spans. And uh, that really allowed a carpentry and cabin, um, uh, furniture and cabinet, uh, cabinet making, those kinds of larger programs to fit in here. If you can go to the mm -hmm. next, and they fit in here kind of like that. Um, this, this is the same shot. So that back door, so this back door here is that back door. You can, it, it's tough to see it because of the sunlight, but um, I yeah. tried to get the same angle. I just want to throw in here, Frano, that I love seeing these images of the, the before before any of the students' material and before there was any build out. It just it looks so heavy, and you really get this the scope of how massive and heavy oh, yeah. and just you know weighty everything is. And there's a lot more stuff in there now, but it just feels more delicate. And maybe it's just the nature of what they're doing in the programs but it's a psychological thing and it just feels more delicate now. Right, I mean, the embodied energy of, the, of a building like this, you absolutely had to save it. And the question is, what would you save it for? I remember that there were people interested in buying this that, that, that did not, were not able to, but I was there at walkthroughs and there were hotel developers, there were all kinds of people, but it was very important for the city to bring this kind of, um, economic driver, I would say, in some ways, because it's about work. It's about jobs. And, um, and that, that is something that, this, that, that the city administration really listened to. And if you want to go to the next. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, one of the, the, the advantages of being up high for uh, furniture making and cabinetry was to have the natural uh, light uh, and to be able to see the materials um, in, in that kind of natural light, if you want to go to the next. And then we're, we're back out. So I, I just wanted to conclude just in, in, a, in one sentence really to say that the whole, one of the, the biggest challenges and um, goals for the North Bennett was to take it out of that kind of closeted condition that it was in, because everybody knew that the North Bennett Street it was a hidden jewel. Uh, you just couldn't walk in it. <laughs> you couldn't move in the old building. So this was an, an important thing to be able to express what goes on inside there and create a kind of urban, an urban reliquary, if you will, by the central space to just sort of put stuff that is made here by the students so that the public could admire it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to pull us out of this and and i just want to mention if we went through the slides too quickly don't worry you'll have a recording of this afterwards um but i just we're just going to have some conversation now around i first want to point out that um nathan is in carpentry right now and frano had mentioned this earlier in the conversation that something you're missing you as our as our guests are missing this visceral experience of being in this space which is so unusual and specific to this to this building you walk in you smell sawdust you um always have sawdust on your person you can't get rid of it <laughs> and so to try to give you a little bit of that um nathan is you know, in a carp in carpentry right now. So I hope you can sort of see what's going on behind him. And his program is right 
<laughs> His pro Nathan's program is right next to carpentry, which um, I heard another anecdote about the strategic placement of those two programs next to each other to sort of cross resonate their disciplines. What was that? Well, the, it, it, it was at a, at a certain, at a certain level, the programs could really only fit where there was room. So we tried as much as possible to create these kind of juxt juxtapositions. So to have, uh, it was exciting to have jewelry, for example, in the same wing of the building as, as carpentry. So you'd have that kind of cross, uh, you know, cross fertilization between the two. Um, uh, or violin making, violin making, which is dealing with woods that are, I don't know, you can talk so much more about the kinds of woods. You open up that closet, Nathan, where you have the different types of woods that you can use for violins. Can you talk about that, that closet? And, and um, it's kind of mind blowing and the different species. Yeah, it's, it feels almost like the bank vault of the violin department. Yes. Uh, we keep all of our prized wood in there and, um, there's some beautiful instruments that come out of our program uh, that just start as raw lumber from, from in that closet. We call them billets and mainly we use maple and spruce uh, to comprise most of the violin and then ebony for, for fittings, fingerboard, that kind of thing. And they each have like uh, their own feeling of working with, but um, storing them properly is so incredibly important. Um, you can use wood that's, that's decades old um, and it will develop different characteristics if you can store it properly. Um, so it, we need a space that's going to be um, ideally away from light, um, have good air circulation um, so it doesn't get too humid or, or too dry. Um, and that way the wood won't dry out too much and crack or swell with humidity and develop mold. Or, or attract any pests. Uh, so that closet for us is an extremely important part uh, to the department, even though you know, it, it's not like, you don't really see it when you walk through the department, but it's there and it's kind of the heart of the space a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, um, one of, one of the, the things that I always think about is the light in violin and you as a department, you typically keep your overhead lights off. Mm -hmm. to maximize the natural light. Is that specific to your, the woods that you're using? Uh, it's more specific to the way that we work. Um, we're trying to achieve very specific uh, shapes in the violin based off of um, the way Antonio Stradivari used to work back in the 1700s. And um, like things look great when they're in the dark, but if you get them outside, they, they can really look uh, unlike what you perceive them to be. So um, seeing color through natural light instead of overhead uh, fluorescent bulbs, um, it, it changes your perspective. Uh, the harsh shadows, you can see little fluctuations in the surface mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the, the piece that you're working on. Um, so you can try to make it uh, either as smooth as possible or have the kind of uh, tool mark quality that you want to put into it, you can get, uh, you can achieve a better specificity out of using natural light mm -hmm. and any other type. Nathan, and, uh, while you're on a roll, can I ask a question, <laughs> uh, Kristen? Um, yes, please. Because uh, not to go down the violin making rabbit hole too deep, but there, there's one, the lacquer, the lacquer room, um, and, and the kind of finish that you put on these raw materials, whether it's the maple or the ebony, can you say something about the importance of that room and the kind of level of detail one has to achieve to get that finish right? Yeah, it's, uh, that, that type of process is definitely a lifelong, uh, endeavor. And um, the, the space provided here at school is, uh, it really helps you realize that as a student. Um, it provides that natural light. We need to see the colors that we're putting on the instrument. 
uh, and it also provides adequate ventilation through the installed uh, air duct that has uh, air exit because um, we're working with the, the varnish is extremely volatile material um, and if you're exposed too much to it it's it's very unhealthy so uh, to be indoors and try to create our own varnish it's um, it's untenable without the proper air circulation um, so uh, we do the chemistry behind it as well as the application in the same room um, and if you're ever in, if you ever get the chance to be in the violin department and you see somebody working on an instrument, they're going to be huddled directly up against that window uh, that's in there and, and just trying to see the color through the natural light. And um, it can take weeks to do a violin varnish, uh, especially if it's an alcohol type. So mm. uh, there's a uh, to have a nice, comfortable space with good light, um, it really helps to maintain the patience that the process requires um, and allow for us to uh, really concentrate on the work at hand um, instead of, of noticing uh, inadequacies around us. So I just want to tag on to that. Um, one, of, one of the sparks of this conversation was actually something that you said, Nathan, months ago about when, when our building closed in March and students were forced to go work, or so they, they had to go set up benches at home. And um, you and Cooper, who's another violin making student, um, set up a bench at home, which was like a, like a <laughs> staples a, card table or whatever. It was a, a Home Depot plastic folding table. There you go. We, we managed to get the last one that existed in Home Depot because I guess, um, during that week or so, Home Depot just got ransacked by people stocking up on supplies and outfitting their homes with things that they needed. So we were fortunate enough just to even manage to get that. Uh, but there's a bit of a wobble to it that takes some getting used to. <laughs> yeah, but you specifically said one of the, the, the most, the, one of the things that you missed the most was being able to come to work in a space that was built for what you do. And yeah. that's always stuck with me, especially after seeing your home workshop. It was, um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was uh, quaint, quirky, uh, something I hope I don't have to do again. But, um, it, you know, it, it definitely reinforced the fact that uh, I love being at school. And um, you, you know that the space is working properly at school when it's really the last thing on your mind. Um, and you're not trying to constantly rearrange your situation or um, push the table against the wall while you're working to avoid vibrations. Um, you know, you, you, it'll, the space here at school really allows, um, it allows you to set up your body in a way that um, working with the materials becomes very easy um, and you don't have to try to force yourself to be in uh, uncomfortable situations that produces, uh, frankly, uh, lower quality work. So mm -hmm. it's nice um, from my perspective that uh, in the workshop, I don't even notice the architecture and it kind of just like becomes part of my situation and, and molds to the process. That speaks to great design. Definitely. Right? Oh, yeah. I just want to um, I just want to shout out to everybody who didn't who didn't maybe didn't see this anonymous tip come in that's so beautifully poetic that um, the pairing of putting violin and jewelry near carpentry is to remind the makers that um, carpenters are making beautiful things. Am I reading this right? And violin makers and jewelers are making useful things. Right sort of the opposite of one another. Right, exactly. Like framers can be sort of dismissed for not being, you know, craftsmen, be, you know, at, at the level mm -hmm. of craft with a capital, capital C um, because they're just framers. And that's not at all true. Um, 
Uh, and I think when you juxtapose that with exactly what Nathan's saying is that the kind of like exactitude and precision and the grace within that, 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 that violins are being made is uh, that, that, that same care can be turn, turned around and understood just depending on who's doing the making. It does require passion though. And you've got passion at that building. <laughs> It's oh, there's a lot of it. Blowing out of the windows. <laughs> I mean, that's something that and that nobody, anybody who works here, you can't dispute the fact that students who come to school here, they're coming because they want to be here. You know, there's there's a solid drive behind that. Yeah. And it's just a magical, magical place to be. I'm going to open this up to some Q&A if anybody has some questions for us. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I keep thinking of the, cent the center uh, Wingate Gallery, the center space that was the missing piece that you referenced, Frano, that was the missing piece of how to um, just how to combine the two buildings and create an, you know, an, an urban setting for these big, heavy, massive trades. And that Wingate Gallery as, as the centerpiece to the school, it is where our programs kind of cross each other and um, we're constantly trying to find ways to do that of, of, you know, everybody gets so focused into their benches and that one space is where we can try to get people to like bump into each other or talk about this book or talk about that vanity they're building. Um, it, it works in that way. I'm looking for question. Do you have any thoughts about how NBSS being in the former police station might be healing for a building that certainly was a site of trauma for those who came under arrest, et cetera? What a great question. To reinvent the space itself from being a place where people were incarcerated to a place where people are building things with their hands. I love that question. That is that that is definitely something that was um, uh, uns it was uns an unspoken sort of narrative in the um, idea of keeping this program in the North End. I mean, the really the the program from a functionality standpoint, it just didn't make sense to be here. I mean, you really need a big yard and, and you need that back space, right? So I think that, that the point that's being made by um, the audience is, is critical. I think it, it certainly becomes something that we're much more you know, conscious of today. I mean, it's certainly something that I thought that thought about, you know, as we were sort of preparing this, Kristen, is this idea of like, you know, policing and, and um, how you then begin to, you know, re rethink, you know, rethink these spaces, these, these spaces of inc incarceration. And I th you're in one, aren't you? Yes, I right. forgot yeah. to bring that up. Yep. Um, I'm in one of the former bunk rooms of the police station, which, um, you know, we can talk about that under this conversation of transforming a space from being a place of incarceration to a place where people tune pianos. But originally I was, you know, the, the notion that um, we had to, you know, where you strategically placed programs, this made sense as a tuning room because it was a former bunk room. But yes, ultimately the end result being a transformation, you know, of what might have occurred in this space. Sure. It's something I take for granted just sitting in here actually. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, that was one of the big reasons to keep the materials as much as possible. I mean, we, we tried with Miguel and everybody to try to keep as much of the glazed block that you see behind you. And you just don't do glazed block buildings anymore either because you can't afford it. But in a way you can't not afford it because it, it's just so beautiful as a material. Each one of those blocks, and we, I got, I think, one or two pieces, is like 
a kind of ceramic vase that you would, you know, have some kind of, you know, Japanese craftsman make. I mean, look at the blocks. Every block behind you is different. Mm -hmm. I love these. I love this color. There's, there's some dispute about how it makes people look and they're, you know, it's just, it's an odd color that you don't really see anymore. Um, but I love it. Yeah. So like that question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever think about that, Nathan, as a student being in this building? I mean, what? Uh, you know? Definitely. I, it gets to the point where you can almost relate each program to the kind of textures the architecture around them creates. Uh, so in, uh, you get a similar feel in bookbinding with, with the blocks, but um, they have more exposed windows. Um, so between the blocks and the light coming through the windows, like for me, that screams bookbinding. And those tight spaces in piano uh, with the texture from the blocks, it, it creates an identity for that program. Uh, and, and in violin, we have a very long space with uh, lots of light coming through those windows or uh, if we have the shades pulled down with directional light from our lamps, it becomes very dark, almost cave-like. So you get really different vibes and, and diff different atmospheres created by the space. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I like to, or not that I like to, it's, it's, uh, it creates a reaction in my mind of what defines part of the program. Mm -hmm. What about um, the, the, the history of the space though? Do you as a student ever think about that this used to be a police station? <laughs> as a student, I didn't. As a student worker, I did. Um, doing student worker stuff, uh, you spend a lot of time in the building pretty much alone. And you have to walk through all of these spaces in the dark by yourself. So when you, you realize the history behind it and you're alone at night in the building, then uh, it, it starts to have certain psychological effects, but uh, when you get used to it, it's, it's not really a big deal. And you, you kind of take it for what it is now. And you know that there are very positive things happening in this building. And it, you know, that history, it's there, but it, it doesn't have quite as much of an emotional effect on me as uh, meeting these students and knowing what happens during the day in the programs and uh, the potential that these space hold for, the potential that the spaces hold for, for like a brighter future. Uh, and like all of these colleagues that I meet, uh, I hope I get to stay in touch with them outside of school because there's some really great people that come through here. Uh, one funny anecdote about this history of the space uh, and, and seeing it in the, the basement of the building that you're in right now. Mm -hmm. There used to be that twister board painted on the floor, yes. uh, which ended up getting uh, cut off. So you could see like three quarters of the twister board painted on a concrete floor with the corner of it cut off by a wall that um, outlined a classroom. And, and for me, that was always the, the creepiest thing was to go down in that basement and it's like really dark and there's just like a twister board that you know, it, and it doesn't make any sense yeah, it running make up the any wall. Sense anymore. Yeah, it's like why? Why is the twister board running up the wall? It's 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 non-functioning at that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part part of the what you just said of the nurture and how you you know you're you're more tuned into the emo your emotional tune in here is more to the fostering of your colleagues and their experience being here. And that also speaks to how the building was designed to be these warm, nurturing spaces, as opposed to cold, hard printing presses. You know, each space is just warm and welcoming and where you want to be. I have a few questions that we're, we have from guests. And I think I've heard you talk about this before. How does this building compare to other schools, studios, or workspaces that you all might be familiar with? And how big is the school? And we, we've, we've talked about this before that, um, and I want, I want to hear Frano's take on this, is you, you've made a comparison between um, the studiousness of a trade school student and 
being in a factory and the difference between the two and how that makes this place unique? Oh, well, I mean, I've always thought that the, uh, well, there, there's a big interest today in making and you, you see that in universities. We do a lot of uh, higher ed work. So a lot of universities want to get social spaces in and they want to get make, maker spaces in um, and emotional spaces. Those are the really three big things, but using your hands. So um, what's incredible about uh, Pauline Agassiz Shaw was that she was like, the created a maker space, like created the mother of all maker spaces. I mean, the North Bennett Street School you know, puts these other tiny little places. I mean, can't even compare them. And, you know, um, and now today you see across the country, like Artisans Asylum, um, super important space. You have new spaces in Detroit, LA, they've got these in incredible um, places. And so I think people go there because they like the chaos. Um, they like the kind of organized chaos of, of, of just stuff. Uh, coming in and doing it the right way, just like Nathan was saying, J being, able, being able to put something together, but like get it to the point where the quality um, is just right and you feel really good about it. And, and that's why you guys, you guys get, um, you know, people who are in finance who, you know, decide they're done. Mm -hmm. They're done with finance. They want to like make something. So they, they you know, get into like, bookbinding or locksmithing yeah i mean but locksmithing is cool it's <laughs> so cool locksmithing is very cool um were were there any discoveries made in this building when it was being renovated do you remember any sort of magical find oh god i do remember um talk about creepy nathan um there were when i arrived <laughs> there were there was all the detritus of everything, just like all over the place. They had moved out the big printing press presses, but they left all the flat files. You know, the flat files are those big files for maps and photographs and evidence. Um, and there was a photography file uh, that was just incredible uh, of, of glass plates, uh, glass slides. And um, they were just, the images were just, you know, uh, incredible. I just wanted to have, you know, you just want to kind of collect, I mean, you could spend a whole lifetime with all the stuff that was gathered over the time that that building was there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so that was sort of more the artifacts of the things that were found. I mean, architecturally, we, we wanted to use everything that we found as much as possible. Um, and because the building, you know, had great bones. They had great bones, great windows. There's really nothing much you had to do about it except just surgically, you know, cut, slice, open, and and insert. It was just a very kind of uh, tact. The, the the tactics were subtle, nuanced, um, and it helped to have Miguel because he was an art. He was an architect as well, as you mentioned. So mm -hmm. we were able to all kind of like walk through and almost make decisions as we move move through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just have a comment I, I, or a question I want to answer for a, a, a guest. The um, uh, person's asking if Nathan is a student or faculty. Um, he is a student um, finishing the violin making program this year. And um, wouldn't we dream of him being on the faculty? Because you ask. <laughs> And Leslie, just, she just says that you, um, you have a poetic, artistic way of expressing architecture and your thoughts. And, and I agree fully. Thank you. It's uh, been doing it for a long time because of my architecture background. And um, uh, before coming to North Bennett, I was involved in art fabrication. So you spend a lot of time in that state of mind of of analyzing the poetics of space and which is a great book by the way it's the poetics of space and, and uh like what these things mean to you and and how they feel viscerally um i think like as uh somebody who's involved in a tactile environment it's important to to think about these things and with uh, these these traditional um trades that we do um you know, they can get repetitive, um, but in a way that lets you think about these sorts of things and um, which I think is so important to 
um, making your everyday like that much better and um, really getting the most out of the process and enjoying yourself as you do it. Do you, Nathan, you, you, I'm sure deep down you have an answer to this. It might be a secret answer, but um, <laughs> what, if you were to take another, learn, study another trade here, what would it be? Preservation carpentry, no doubt. I actually uh, intended on applying to that program initially because of my architecture background. Um, and didn't, I had no idea about violin making until I uh, looked into the school and ended up going that route instead of preservation carpentry. Was it on site when you came to visit the school that you, you recognized violin making? No, I, uh, I found it on the website um, before coming to school and um, had many, uh, many nights with, with little sleep, just mulling over the idea of what it might be like to get into violin making. Uh, I'm not a musical person, but uh, it, I realized that the, the type of work in the program was more um, along the lines of what I like to do as a maker. And um, I went with my gut on it and it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before and long before how there, not, not too many violin makers even, well, I guess I can't speak to the world, but in this program are not musicians first. Is that correct? Yeah, I'd yeah. say um, most violin makers have in the program have at least some, some sort of background with music, whether it's uh, performance or uh, through the industry itself. But, you know, I, I wouldn't discourage anybody from thinking I shouldn't get into violin making or instrument building because I've never picked up an instrument before. It's, for me, it's more about what the process is like uh, mm -hmm. and what your personality, what your personality is like and how you like to make things than, than what it is. Because we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're making a tool for somebody um, that, that's going to use for, for hopefully a very long time for their career. So um, it's, it's important to know how it functions musically, but um, it's extremely important to be able to build it um, well with quality and um, understand what the final product has to do. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to ask a, another question that somebody posted earlier um, to you, Frano. It, can, can you speak briefly about the space and the energy management systems that are kind of a big deal here that we obviously didn't have at 39 North Bennett? Yes, yeah. So Bureau Happold was the consulting uh, engineer who did the mechanical system and uh, we went with a, a variable volume uh, they call it a VRF um, system uh, so that's different than a central system it's it's a distributed system uh, and the reason we did that was that the a central system requires huge ducts uh, that you take from that central point and then they get smaller and smaller as you spread it out over the 65,000 square feet the VRF being distributed uh, means that you have shorter duct lengths and we could take advantage of height, uh, which we would need, especially in you know, carpentry, preservation carpentry. Uh, so what you see on the roof, for example, is a lot of little units called mini splits. Uh, they're also much more energy efficient uh, than, um, than your central systems. I think what people should understand is that the uh, North Bennett Street School has uh, uh, 50 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof. And so this was extremely unusual um, and radical. I think it was the first project that tested the city's um, green energy program uh, when it went in. It went in right after we, uh, the, the building opened. Um, and the utility company did a kind of trade-off and so in the next uh, two years, um, North Bennett Street will have paid the savings on that energy will have paid for the um, uh, for the cost of putting those panels up there, and it's just much better uh, for the planet. So, mm -hmm. but 
yeah, the, 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 the air circulation, the balancing, all the dust collection, it's just a huge, a huge effort that went into making sure that even though you still, still get sawdust on you, mm -hmm. uh, try not to try to reduce, you know, make it a healthy space for people right. like me and others to work. I'm, I'm reading that this new building where we are now is twice as big as the old and uses less energy and costs less. Not yeah. surprised. Um, I think I can ask you one more question, um, it, it's a short one. During the design of this space, what criteria were considered for any future expansion, increased students, or adding an additional trade? Was that a part of the consideration? Uh, yeah, well, anytime that we do a building for any client, we always try to build in that expansion, whether it's 20% or whatever you, you, can, you can get, a, a new building, you know, 50 years down the line. Uh, in this case, there was, um, there's no room um, except uh, for the, the small, uh, very 20 foot facade, essentially, of the administration, tunnel administration building. Um, unfortunately, uh, that, I mean, fortunately, that went out to, to, to uh, bid, but somebody else got it and underneath, under Miguel's nose. And that really irked him and me. Um, so that was sort of an expansion area there. But to be honest, the building at 65,000 square feet had more room than North Bennett, like in much more room than it really needed. And so there was built in room within all the departments. So there, there would be, I think, an, the, the opportunity to kind of um, add, potentially add students. I don't know, I may be speaking a little bit out of turn. Uh, in the building, it was already bigger. That was why that common space over the garage, that was not mm -hmm. a, originally part of the program, but it was there. It, we weren't just going to leave that roof of the garage sitting there and let it was a roof of a garage. So that was a something that we had to fundraise to make work and and those kinds of um uh th that kind of generosity of space that the building provided in a way has that built in uh uh the the, the built-in opportunity to to expand but other than that no not that i know of. so from claire uh, claire fruitman who's our provost um she's been she just She's been here for 20 years. She just celebrated her 20th year here. And so she's been through, she had spent, spent pl plenty of time in the old building and was part of the transition in here. And she just um, noted that we were able to double the size of carpentry by moving into this space, which now is at 25 students. Um, and they, they're on a nine month cycle. So every year we have 25 students. That's how many we can fit into that program. I'm just going to grab this lantern here. I've been told that I need to show that up front. So give me a second, everybody. <laughs> so if you remember in the slideshow, there was a picture of um, one of the old workspaces in uh, in the old workshops in 39 North Bennett, and they were, they made these lanterns. Well, this is a candle holder, but the style uh -huh. of punch, um, they made, they were making lanterns. So this is one of them. And if you walk through the North End, there, every so often down the street here, there's a little old shop. Um, it's a gift shop. Um, they have one in the window, and I'm not 100% sure it was produced at North Bennett, but it looks like it would have been, and it's in the right location. So if you ever see one in a window in the North End, it's probably that. Kristen, I have a question for you. When can, uh, if people, once we get over this whole COVID thing, d d does uh, North Bennett Street have regular tours um, for people who might want to just be able to, like the 40 people that were on this program, uh, might want to just... Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, once we're back to normal, we have an open house every year, and it happens in November, typically. This year it's going to be virtual and span over a week in December. Um, and 
so we'll have a bunch of programs for that that you can tap into and sign up for. But once we're back in person, then you'll be able to come into a, a two day long open house where you can walk through all of the programs to the furthest corner of the room. And I hope you all join us for, for that when, when we're back to normal, um, because I think we tried to do this building justice through this event. I hope that you got some sense of the space and the feel, um, but definitely when it's time to come in person, you, you really should, and we hope that you do. And I don't think we have any more questions unless, um, Nathan, do you have any questions? Um, can I stay here forever? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have the same question. question. Can <laughs> I stay here forever too? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone. I appreciate you all joining us today. And Frano, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Yep. And Nathan, thank you so much for your time. And we will see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs>